for discussion. And we're certainly, I have one right here. Oh, you have one, okay. And we're not gonna tackle all the issues in this half hour, so I think our objective is to try and get as many of the questions on the table as possible. Um, I'll ask a few questions drawing from here, then we'll open up to the audience. And anyone can jump in if you wish or not, but let's try and get through uh, many if we can. Uh, there's one that builds off a tweet here uh, from someone named Alaria Ampolini, who's from the University of Trento in Italy, which I think is fantastic. We have a global reach here. But, and I hear it in the comments, is engagement something we're gonna tack on to people's jobs? This is one more thing on people's very full plates. Or is it something that's synergistic with your work? Do we have to create a different category of professor who does this compared to a professor who's just focusing on the A-level publications? How do you see the intersection and the overlap between this activity we're talking about and the traditional activities of the professor? Anyone? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take one first stab because I, I think we're acting as if the normal and the past has been to not communicate and as if now we need to start communicating, and that is just fundamentally wrong. Um, in the mid-19th century, we created land-grant universities where the congressional language surrounding the creation and the, the investment that the government made in the university system was to teach farmers direct quote, uh, to teach farmers to grow two blades of grass instead of one, to take what we do in the lab and, and make it societally useful, to have this conversation, to, to have an impact. The, I, that's why we have communication departments that are sitting in colleges of agriculture and life sciences. This is not an oversight that somebody did wrong at some point and didn't move it over into letters and science. This is something that was by design. Um, and so the idea, I think, that we, that, we, that we need to all of a sudden change our philosophy is fundamentally wrong because the philosophy was right from the beginning. Our activities didn't live, live, up, to, live up to that philosophy. Um, and I think that's where really the culture change needs to, needs to happen. In the 80s in, in Europe, uh, one of the German chancellors talked about what he called the Bringschuld der Wissenschaften, the responsibility of sciences to deliver to society and to interact with society. So really that responsibility that, and the Germans putting a bunch of words together have this a little bit easier than we do. Um, but you know, the social contract with science that we're talking about in this country is not any different. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the, the more we see science under attack, rightfully or not, but that should just highlight the need for us to live up to that philosophical commitment that we made in, the, in 1862. Go ahead. And I would say that one of the biggest resistances that faculty on campuses have had to promotion and tenure reform is the idea that this will be an add-on and everyone will be required to do it. And you get that same resistance around other kinds of activities, entrepreneurism, or you can add, and the, the campuses that have done the best in these kinds of reforms both figure out a way that it can be integrated into a holistic portfolio, and yet they also acknowledge that for folks who this is their, uh, the main focus of what they're doing, it will require some modification to tenure criteria and or the ability to make a case for the quality of your work using uh, different measures of impact, right, than might be normally expected with H-index. And, and also that it has implications for those folks in terms of their peer reviewers, that you, know, you don't send, uh, that, that you think about that in terms of how that's chosen. So most of the APT reform has not said everybody has to do it or created a separate section, but I, the better promotion and tenure reform has created a pathway for folks who are doing this at, at the highest levels to have that work they, they say context is, is key to fair evaluation, so that their, their work is seen in the context or the lane that it's in and can be evaluated based on measures of, of high impact in that lane for what they're trying to do. Could you envision someone getting tenure for having impact in the public sphere with a modest research record? Well, first of all, it depends on where we're talking. I mean, okay. a lot of the conversation about APT reform assumes that all universities are Harvard, you know, uh, Yale, Princeton, and places, and, and the vast majority of faculty are creating their careers and pathways in other institutional types. So that's one thing I would say. Um, you know, I, I think the issue is more, um, are we creating pathways within an academic career for somebody to be in the zone with this work and it to be evaluated for its quality in that, uh, in that context. Um, most folks who are involved in engagement are doing it from a research base that's, that's pretty, pretty darn strong. So, it's, so you know, um, although want the science communication work that they're doing to be evaluated on its own 
for the high impact it's having. So I think it's a matter of changing the, the view that we have on the work uh, to move it into a, a form of scholarship that can be acknowledged for what it is. Anna? I think for me as someone who takes funding that is from taxpayer money, it's an obligation to give back to society because it's our money and everyone's money. <laughs> We've been doing that all along. Is it just that the reward systems have got out, out of whack with what we're supposed to do? Emmanuel, one second. I think people, I think people in the academy sometimes forget that we're, we we use this money. Simple. It's really simple. But you know, we're not up in these. I we you know we say we're in ivory towers, but we're, we we are we're representing the people's money. I mean, this is what we're doing. Our research is funded by them, so it's an obligation. Emmanuel. I would say uh, this idea of a, a moderate researcher and uh, an additional perspective, right? So universities uh, can generate revenue through a number of different means. And so typically uh, researchers leverage their research in order to get more grant money that comes in and great. Um, but technology transition um, and licensing is another avenue through which uh, science and engineering researchers have the capability to bring additional revenue into the university. And so if a, a moderate researcher was able to take all of their moderate research and bring it to the marketplace and bring in additional revenue through licensing, <laughs> that, that should be recognized by the university as well. But th there's a question that uh, needs to be asked. You, you chose not to go the academic route. How much of that was driven by a, a, a sense that you could have more impact in the real world outside of academia? Uh, well, let's see. I think, um, well, I wouldn't say more impact. I look at it as a system. Uh, a system. I'm a, electric systems engineer um, by training, right? <laughs> Everything has to work together. Um, and when components are in the proper place and doing their, their proper job, then the whole system functions optimally, right? Um, and so uh, given that, within every industry, there, has to be, um, there have to be individuals who are able to understand the technical context and the details but have uh, a broader perspective to understand how technology integrates in society. And so I believe I'm most effective in that particular role. And okay. As we start to think about changing rewards, how does this differ on stage of career? Should we have different evaluations for different stages in career? Is this dangerous for a junior faculty member? Because let's face it, this is an open market. Your individual schools could say, we have a new reward system. A junior faculty member would be crazy to follow it unless they're guaranteed tenure because they may not have a packet that's saleable in the open market. So how do we factor a uh, stage of career into this conversation? I think junior faculty are the most energetic at that point. So to capture that energy at that point is critical because after they go through, they're mentored to do the same as who they followed. But the reward system is what it is. Is that a dangerous encouragement? It, yeah, I mean, I. You know, it perpetuates itself. It's self-perpetuating. If that's what the reward system is just, you know, publishing papers and not engaging, it's going to cycle through and it's not going to change. I mean, so. I, I think there's an analogy with doing interdisciplinary research without necessarily even the, the, the communication aspect to right. it. That it used to be people would say, oh, yeah, come in and work in your discipline and establish yourself and whatnot. And then when you get tenure, you can reach out and do some interdisciplinary work. It doesn't work well because yeah. you, we learn what we do, we learn our methods, we become kind of pot bound in the stove pipe or whatever. That's a pretty mixed <laughs> metaphor. And then you, the stove is not going to work real well at that point. But, but, and off you go, you do that. And, and so I came in two, I was an untenured assistant professor in two colleges, uh, in departments that I didn't have any professional degree in. And the, the, as such, you learn how to, 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 to navigate those waters. And sure, there's a little danger, but it's a fabulous, fun job. And the same is true on the communication side. I think if we tell people to wait until they're senesced old people like me, <laughs> that agreed, can be very agreed, interesting. Agreed, agreed, so Just to jump on that, because I do actually think we have two separate problems. Right? I think we have problem number one, and that's at the, at, at the tenure track level. And I think that a lot of the tenure guideline changes that are made are designed to, to take es es essentially that, that un uncertainty out. To say, we're going to talk about, um, at the first day you come in, we'll talk about what you want to do, what the outcomes are. We're going to together establish standards and for excellence that you want to live up to. 
And so it's actually a very predictable process. And that's, it's designed to be that very much like research, typical indicators of, of research quality and impact would be. Um, so I think that's really important at the assistant level. But I think we have an, a similar problem in the current system at the full level, meaning we put people in a hamster wheel and make them run for 12 years. And then when they really figured out how to make electricity and they get really good at it, they were like, now jump off of it and start, you know, basically, now that you don't have those pressures anymore, you know, e explore the world in, in, in the ways you always wanted to. Um, and, and that's a really difficult transition to make because by that time, and we had this conversation over dinner last night, by that time, I'm really good at the hamster wheel. Um, why would I stop publishing in all these outlets that I now have really perfected? I know exactly what to write and how to write it to get into those. And I think that's another, it's a, it's a real tragedy that, we, that when we reach the stage at a full professor level where we don't have to worry about that, the next step all that much, that then we, we don't, it's really difficult to make that transition, let me put it that way. And I think those are two separate problems. Yeah, one of my colleagues are slightly different quipped solutions. one time that one of the problems with our profession is we have too many senior professors thinking like junior professors, and that, that that's itself exactly perpetuates. Right. Okay, I'm going to turn to the audience in one second. I'm going to ask one more question, and, and it's one that's, that's uh, perplexed me. When we have conversations like this, how does the conversation change by discipline? Can we really talk about engagement, <clears throat> public engagement, changing reward systems in economics, in the same as business, in the same as engineering, in the same as biotech? Does the question differ by dif discipline? <clears throat> Has to. Yeah. I mean, so I'm an atmospheric chemist, and the questions in climate and whatnot, and it's sort of one of the one of the reasons that we're doing what we're doing is because there's a strong societal element, and, <clears throat> you know, as opposed to maybe pure. I like. I mean, I do particle physics at CERN, and all the people who are looking at the Higgs kind of say, "What? <laughs> You're doing?" But we are. So it, it, it's sure. The way, the way the conversation goes has to be not just discipline science engineering, but the specific area. And, and I would add that some of the best um, promotion and tenure reforms take it after they've done the definitional work at the university level, they actually go to college and department guidelines and do this piece of saying, here's what engaged scholarship is in our field, and here is what it is not. And here are the criteria using language within that field of how we would evaluate high quality in this work that's specific and using, again, the language of that discipline. And so nobody is, um, it scripts the unscripted, what is this work, what is science communication, what is high quality uh, public engagement, which is what we need. That's what that, the, those reforms are doing, and I think that's most helpful. I, I would second that, um, just, to, just to say, in, in, yeah, I think the idea of having a domain or industry-specific guidelines for what effective engagement actually looks like is important because uh, in, in a field like uh, climate where there is uh, intense public scrutiny, um, engagement may look a particular way, but in some more traditional fields, um, engagement could look like participating in a standards development group or, or a, a technical committee within an organization that's prominent in that particular industry. And so uh, I think uh, it's important that we don't pigeonhole engagement to just look at you know, public domain, social media, our blog posts or things like that. There are many different ways for scientists to engage beyond the university or beyond the traditional public. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think what you're hitting on also is the difference between the channel and the audience. The impact is on the audience. Just, just publishing a blog is not impact, but which audience you're hitting, and that can differ by discipline. A business school wants me to see impact on the world of business. A law school would want you to see it in the profession of law and, and so forth down the line. Okay, let's turn to the audience. And um, right back here with the white turtleneck, or yeah, right here with the white turtleneck, and there's a mic coming to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Duchel, Penn State, and I'm a science educator. Um, some of the hall talk outside over the past couple of days has begun to sort of crystallize on that, the focus of how to impact um, faculty is during the graduate training and talking with people about is it before, during, or after? And people say, oh, well, not after for all the reasons you're describing. And so maybe there's an after after, which I hear is we'll wait till you get full professorship and then you can let go and go back. But I want to talk about the before because we haven't been talking about one thing that I think needs to be a part of the conversation. We've got the natural sciences, we've got the social sciences, not hearing much about the learning sciences. And, um, and when we look at the data, 
We've, the data tells us very clearly that by the fifth grade and sixth grade, most of our children are opting out, opting out of STEM ideas, STEM careers. And so um, some of our efforts, if we wait until um, high school or other areas, it could be too little too late. But it's not you know, impossible to do that. So I think that one of the ways that I'd like to encourage, um, it's picking up on uh, Neil's point about interdisciplinary work, is that it's possible to get into disciplinary work by faculty at all levels, working with colleagues across the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the learning sciences, and to do so in the area of building out new curriculum, building out new problem-based, design-based kind of scenarios. Because what's interesting about the learning sciences, it is inherently dis interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something with young children, you need a developmental psychologist on board. If you're doing something with adult learners, you need an adult learner on board. If you're diving into climate science, you need a climate modeler on board to help break down the kind of ideas. So I think we have to uh, open up the conversation. Thank you. Comment on that, based on some uh, past experience with the Science and Engineering Ambassador Program um, and its pilot in the uh, <laughs> uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I believe it's, it's unreasonable to suggest that uh, faculty should interact directly with uh, uh, small children and try to uh, educate them about very complex scientific issues. Why? Because they're not trained to do that well. <laughs> That's not really going to work out. But forums where uh, we uh, sort of a, a train the, the trainers, teach the teachers kind of uh, environment. There were some great uh, NSF funded um, programs to this effect around, say, five, ten years ago. Many of them may still exist. Um, but being able to take the, uh, the, the best of what's going on, um, the forefront of innovation, and connect those who are there working in research um, with educators is important. Through the Science and Engineering Ambassador Program, I've seen efforts that not only worked uh, formally in uh, train the trainers types of programs, but also in informal educational uh, circumstances like uh, science centers and museums and other uh, forums as well. And so I think that there, there's, there's a plethora of opportunities that are available um, when we allow our research community to be engaged with educators. And some of that has um, been done and is documented and, uh, and works. A, a, a quick t tweet that builds on this question of broadening the audience and not being so narrow on particular disciplines. It comes from Amanda Stanley. She says, how do we support non-academic scientists using, doing science communication? The focus here is on academia, but most STEM PhDs don't end up in academia. Any thoughts on that? A quick one, again, with the Science and Engineering Ambassadors Program, is it was actually set up with, mem with ambassadors in academia in national laboratories in the Pittsburgh area and in industry for exactly that purpose to get that dialogue going on. Um, and also with a, a, a sort of advisor mentor relationship so, so doctoral students like Emmanuel um, were involved. So that was actually a specific objective. And our PhD minor at Wisconsin is actually tailored explicitly toward people who either want to do this as part of an academic career but then also for folks who may want to go in a triple S or into other careers that, that may not involve academia. And oh, I can add to that. So I've been at the undergraduate and graduate level. My, the way I don't even lecture, I, have, I do active learning, problem-based learning by teaching how to communicate science visually and orally and verbally um, with lots of different ways to do that by creating blogs and writing 150 wor word um, synopsis of primary literature and getting it out there on the web. And so what happens from that organically is students realize that they might want to go do this science policy or be a science journalist from that experience. And, or I've had students go to art school and he wanted to be a science illustrator. They didn't even know that was an option. And so if you teach in different modes and learn that there are different ways of learning and different, you know, that you know those exist, you should put those in the classroom and do that, and students you know, will find that. But it takes a lot of you know, work to know, do that without engagement. I'll say this quickly, too. Uh, in order to take early stage research and uh, develop it fully to commercialization and get it out into a complex, complex socioeconomic environment to have an impact on society, it takes the coordination of scientists and engineers and non-technical folks um, from universities, national labs, uh, private industry, um, other organizations, everybody working together. So part of my work um, as a consultant with uh, Energetics Incorporated is structuring those dialogues and creating uh, forums, um, summits, 
um, workshops, you name it, in order to get diverse opinions together. So many of our scientists and engineers don't wind up um, in academia, but wherever they land, they have a particular perspective and they fit on the spe spectrum of technology development. And everybody's uh, opinion and perspective is needed in order to get technologies from initial conception to actually having an impact on society. Okay, way in the back with the mic, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Malinowski. I'm a PhD geneticist who has recently transitioned <laughs> to medical and science writing full time. And coming from that academic perspective and now in the communication area, I agree wholeheartedly that in general, scientists need to become better educator or communicators, sorry, um, and that there needs to be a system in place to make that happen. But I take slight issue with the idea that it needs to come from the tenure process and changing incentives. I actually think that there's a real need for someone who has a similar background to mine, people who were trained as scientists, not necessarily at the PhD level, um, but certainly at the master's level, who have a real understanding <coughs> of the science, of the technology, of the methods that are used, who also have the communication background. Um, I really like that University of Wisconsin model with the PhD sort of minor in communication, and I think that's a great way to make that happen, but I also think that that's very self-selected. You're going to get the people who are already on board with communicating, and I think in trying to make the incentives um, in the tenure process so that you sort of force scientists to become better communicators, you're also self-selecting for a group of scientists that are likely going to do that anyway. You could maybe make it more effective, but I think they're going to be doing it anyway. So perhaps um, would anybody want to you know, talk about sort of a role for somebody who, um, again, has my background and wants to fill that niche? Perhaps you could embed people with those skills in a lab, in a university, in a department, and that's their job. They, they know the science, and then they can bridge that, and perhaps that might be more of um, an incentive, right? You know, a PI hires a cadre of um, assistants and postdocs and graduate students to work in their lab. And perhaps you need to also have a communications person that fills a vital role that's equally important. I'd like to speak to that one. I, I absolutely think you're right. And we know that, um, you know, nationally, you know, half of the, the percentage of our faculty that are tenure track it has decreased incredibly and many more professional track. But I think the bigger issue is that I, I actually see a lot of that happening particularly in the larger universities where the broader impacts work out of NIH and NSF has created funds that allow these interdisciplinary teams to be created and sort of organically, entrepreneurially, um, folks are taking advantage of that and creating teams that have folks embedded from a variety of different perspectives off the tenure track, communicators, um, folks from, sometimes it'll, it'll be a team that has somebody from education, uh, communication, um, you know, all of these different areas working together uh, on the projects. The, the NRT grant that I mentioned at Maryland um, on language science totally has attracted that kind of a interdisciplinary group of, of folks from, that it's not just about the tenure track. And the Alan Alda, um, the National Academies work, the op-ed project, they're all coming on campuses and inviting people to workshops that are from multiple roles, not just tenure track, by any means, and that's what we need to do, because we need to create pathways for everybody to be doing this. But, so, but I, I would add, I think part of this, this conversation is not telling every academic they need to do this, but broadening the tent and to allow different models of what an academic can be. So if certain people do self-select towards this minor and want to have that as their academic identity, I don't necessarily see that problem just as if someone doesn't want to do it, and some people shouldn't do it, they can remain in the lab and do that basic work and will still be valued and important in the academy. So just to add one small element to that, I also think there's a, there's a dangerous <coughs> vicious cycle. So what happens every time, and the way the two are related, I totally agree with you in the self-selection, but I think the tenure and the, and the, 
and the minor self-selection are actually related. Every year <coughs> when our cohort comes in, inevitably in the first week, I get a couple emails of people who say, my PI doesn't let me spend the time, sorry, I can't do this, I, I need to drop out of the minor. Um, those PIs inevitably happen to be older, white, and male, right? So they're um, <laughs> so the beginning statement about what needs to happen. And, and, the, and, and the basic idea is that, that having self-selection into, uh, having a tenure process that, that incentivizes a different way of thinking about communication will also produce advisors who create a culture for more and more students self-selecting into degree programs like this. <coughs> so there will be a, a positive self-reinforcing spiral where right now we're actually seeing, still seeing a, a more negative self-reinforcing spiral. So I think the two are actually related and hopefully at some point that will switch over into a, into a positive link where advisors like Anna are gonna you know, encourage students to do that rather than, or creating the climate for students to self-select into it rather than the other way around. Yeah, I, I deny that my beard has red, got gray hair in it. It has some red. <laughs> but very, very quickly, the, um, the, the two students, or two of the students that I mentored in the Science and Engineering Ambassador Program, one is now doing uh, the media outreach for the College of Engineering uh, after he received his PhD. Another one had a AAAS media fellow as the science reporter for, for uh, Colorado Public Radio for a summer. Um, and. In, in, in spite or in addition to that, is, is a postdoc and is, is trying currently to decide whether to pursue an academic career or some alternative. Um, so I think these do open up career pathways. I think an important uh, aspect of this is what is communicated and how. When scientists self-select to communicate, they communicate in a particular way. And it's mostly about defending the, the validity of their assumptions, the methodology that they use. They're trying to prove this is good science, the results are uh, shouldn't be questionable. These, these are great results because we're good scientists and we did good science work. And the rest of the world rarely, you know, cares about that particular perspective. People are looking at, you know, what are the implications of this, um, like some of the, the climate work, or, you know, what's the significance of this? I've seen many people who uh, give presentations uh, trying to get more funding, um, and I've been on the evaluation end of some of those, and they've never even established the importance of the work that they're doing or the significance of it. They're just defending this is good science and you should continue to support me because I'm a good scientist. So I, I, de I think that we definitely need people who have the ability to understand what's going on in the science and in the results and then help to translate that for other stakeholders who are interested in science but have different perspectives. That is a perfect way to bring this to a close because I'm afraid we're up against the time limit. I'm sure we could fill the entire afternoon for this, but please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>